I get the privilege of opening the Bible with us this morning, so if you have a Bible, why don't you open to James chapter 2, and, uh, and we'll jump in. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay, our words are on the screens behind us here, and you can read along with us in there, I promise that's from God's Word as well. Um, there's nothing magical about the book itself, there's magic in the words in a sense, but it's because uh, it's, it's powerful because it's God's Word, and we have it because the Holy Spirit gave it to men who wrote this book, and we believe in it, and so we submit ourselves to it, and so today we get to open that up together. And we're doing it in one of the most practical books of the New Testament. We're actually doing it in a book called James, as we study this summer for several weeks. And this book is probably one of the most practical for us um, to know how to live out our faith in the New Testament. And so it's a great book to read. It has a little controversy in it, which we'll study today, and we'll get a chance to jump into that. But it, it honestly, what we've said is it disrupts our lives a bit, is what it does. And we like that idea. We have a faith that's supposed to disrupt us, and it's supposed to change the way we think about things, and it's supposed to make us realize, oh, our, our lives are supposed to be different because of our faith in Christ. So we've called this a disruptive faith, this study through the book of James. And so we've had several things we've looked at. And today, I'm calling today's message the dichotomy of faith, is what I'm calling today's message. And the reason why is because we have a big dichotomy of faith in the book of James at the end of chapter chapter 2. And let me just give you what I say is the dichotomy of faith, and it's this. Jesus loves you enough to accept you as you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. That's the dichotomy of faith. Jesus loves you enough to accept you wherever you're at right now. You can have full acceptance in Christ, but he loves you too much to let you stay where you are or stay the way you are. And that's the dichotomy of faith. Well, isn't supposed to love supposed to be like unconditional or something like that? Well, yes, he accepts you, but there's such a great love that Christ has for us that he draws us to himself. And the longer we know him, after we say yes to him, we have this sense that our faith actually develops. And that is a really cool thing. And that's what we see in James 2 today. Let me start off with a little story. When I was a young man, I was traveling through the country of New Zealand. It was an awesome experience. Anyone been to New Zealand here? It is beautiful. This is before it was Middle Earth, um, and you know, it came out years later with Lord of the Rings and all that kind of stuff. It became very pretty, um, but it was great because I spent six weeks there. We flew into Christchurch on the South Island of New Zealand, and there was a team of about 15 of us young people um, who flew in together, and, and if you don't know, New Zealand is split up into two halves, so we stayed in the South Island for part of it, and we spent a good two to three weeks just hanging out in the mountains, doing some rock climbing, did some mountaineering. We didn't quite get technical in climbing you were those amazing southern alps but we did play in the mountains a little bit which was a great thing Um, but one of the things we did is during part of the time we drove after that was done we drove from uh, Christchurch on up and we cruised up into this place called Picton and at Picton there's a famous ferry there and at this ferry you take it across and you go to the North Island it's really beautiful because there's all these dolphins that are swimming with you and it's just an amazing place if you've ever taken the Sawasan ferry up to Canada where you go through all the islands the San Juan Islands and stuff it's beautiful it's kind of like that except on steroids it's like amazing some of the picturesque sights you see there in New Zealand well, we landed in, um, on up through Wellington, and at Wellington, we spent about a week there, and then we drove up, and we were going to drive from Wellington to Auckland, which is up on the top of the North Island, but halfway in the middle of that, there's this place called Lake Taupo. Lake Taupo is a very famous place for something in, that was made popular in the 1980s, 1990s, and it became known as the first place that they ever had bungee jumping, all right? Now, bungee jumping was amazing. We decided we were all going to go there. We're going to go to this place in Lake Taupo, and we're going to go to the first place that they had bungee jumping, supposedly. Now, I looked it up this week, and there's some argument about where it started. Um, most people say it did start in New Zealand, but they were advertising it as the best place, and now they they advertise it as the only place that you jump over the water and you can have a water landing. They have a bridge out over Lake Taupo, 170 meters or 170 feet up, and you're able to jump down. You can actually touch the water if you want to. In fact, I have a picture of it here from Lake Taupo's bungee jumping resort there. Now, that's not me. I don't look as cool as that, but I did bungee jump. In fact, it was one of those cool experiences where I was much younger and didn't have children or a wife at this time. And so I was traveling with this group of people and we were all excited about doing this. And so about half our group decided to do this. And I I was flat broke at the time. I had no money. So all the team kind of scavenged their money together and they paid my way for me to go to bungee jumping, which was very fun. And I remember this 
because I, I got ready to go. I was all psyched up about it. I thought I could make this happen. And, and part of this thing is they send you through an orientation class. So you go and you, you kind of get your harness on, you get ready. I guess uh, I was getting ready to, to, to make this jump happen. And I wandered up there and they did this class. And there was either a guy or a gal, I can't remember, but she started talking about the, the, cl- the jump itself and said, you know, this is going to be an amazing experience, you know, all these things. But they wanted to set our minds at ease a little bit. So I remember one of the things she said was, um, just to let you know, if you're nervous about the bungee jump, that rope, that cord can hold an elephant, is what she said. And I was like, well, I don't weigh as much as an elephant. That's a good sign for me. I can make it happen. And so I thought, that's great. And so I, I, I kept that in mind, and I walked forward, and I was getting ready to bungee jump. And after the orientation class, they go, and I get to a place where a guy is standing there, and he goes, hey, do you want to touch the water this time? I'm like, sure, I'm going to die anyway, so why not touch the water on the process of this, right? So he's like, yeah, touch the water. And so he weighed me. I hopped him on a scale. And I'll never forget because they wrote my weight on my hand, and they wrote 73 on there, which is how much I weighed in kilograms because it's New Zealand. And I'll never forget it. I actually can picture it in my mind right now, 73, because I was so scared at the moment. I was like, oh, this is real, and I'm shaking, you know? Like, I'm going to jump off the edge. Well, I get up there, and they get my feet tied in, kind of like this guy is here, and and it's so funny because I thought it would all be like, you know, at your own pace, we're going to let you go and you can jump, it's going to be nice, we're going to pat you on the head, no, 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 no. I get up there, I stand on the edge and there's like a crowd standing on the side and they're all getting ready to count down and there's a guy standing behind me with his hand on my butt, like (laughs) pushing on me and I'm, and I'm pushing back like, no, 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 no. I'm good. I'll get, I'll get this. And he's like, no, no, no. One, two, three. And he just shoves me off the edge, you know, no grace at all. Just gives me a big shove. And I probably looked something like that as I went over, not because I'm as cool as that guy, because I was scared to death. And the whole way down, I'm like, okay, elephant, don't fail me now. You know, like, and for some reason though, I didn't hit the water. I'm not sure if they, they uh, didn't exactly do it right, but I got down there and the first fall is terrifying, but then you start bouncing around, boing, like a rubber band, you know, and that's kind of fun. And at the end of it, they drop you off. There's a boat down there. You can kind of see in the picture. I know it's small for you, but they let you off on the boat and they make you walk back up to your car because people get so much adrenaline in this, they drive away in their cars and they get in car accidents. So, so they made us walk about a mile back up the road to kind of get the adrenaline away from us. It was very fun. But the interesting thing is, the whole way there, I had to put what I believed about something into action. Now, you may say, the guy was pushing on you. There's no action there. But I could have pulled out at any time and said, I'm done. I don't want to do this. You know, I could have been free from the whole thing. But there was a sense that I had to believe something. But I didn't really believe it until the very moment I jumped off the edge and fell down towards the water that was coming at me. So I had to take that idea, the elephant that could, you know, this rope could hold is going to hold me and I'll be safe. I would... I want to say to you today, I think this is what James does in James chapter 2, as he says, your faith is not really faith until you put it into action, until you actually take that thing that you believe and do something about it. And I think that's what James is going to tell us. And so this idea, while he may not have bungee jumping in mind, James does not, he does have the idea that if we believe something, it becomes part of us when we walk it out, when we live it out. And so let's read this passage in James 2, verses 14 through 26, and see what James has to say about faith for us today. James says these words, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, excuse me, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Useless, excuse me. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and that faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. One of the most controversial scriptures in the New Testament, I would say. 
you say that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Verse 25, in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. The body apart from the breath, that word in James or Genesis 2, that idea that if you don't have life breath in you, you can't live. So the idea that faith dies unless you have something to add to it here. This is controversial. Do you know that? Very controversial piece of scripture. It is important for us to understand what James is saying. I don't know if you caught the tone, if you've been with us the last few weeks in the book of James, you might have noticed a bit of a shift in tone that James has at this point. In fact, he starts calling people names. Everything was nice up till now, but suddenly he starts calling people names like foolish people. Doesn't sound very nice. He gets all worked up. I can imagine him with his pen writing the letter and all of a sudden it starts fuming and he starts remembering things that are going on with the community that's around him, people that are saying they believe in Jesus but not living like it, and he's starting to write and his pen's starting to have flames at the end of it, right? You foolish people, don't you know that you're supposed to live a certain way? So, so the tone changes a little bit. And I think it changes for us to understand the nature of the warning in this passage. The nature that James is getting worked up for something important that we should as well, that we should take this very seriously. Now, let me give you some context of the Bible so you're not confused about this or if I can help clarify it a little bit. I want to say to you today, did you know that the Bible is written to tell Christians, Christians, how to live? Do you know that? Maybe you did. I think some people wonder if the Bible is meant to be something that tells everyone the way to live. And yes, it does, but the Bible's specifically written to tell people who believe in Jesus about what life in Christ is supposed to be like. And we're supposed to submit ourselves to the Bible and live it out humbly, as I said a minute ago. Now, for purposes of clarity, let me start by saying that the Bible could also be summed up in a couple purposes in that. So the first thing it actually shows us is it tells people how to be saved. It tells people how to come to faith in Jesus. And then secondly, it tells saved people how to live their life in Jesus. And that's important to get those down. It's important to understand that there's an important order to this, and we cannot confuse the order. It throws off everything about belief in what the Bible says. If we mix up the order, we end up with a weird theology and strange views of actually how we're saved in the first place. And this is really near and dear to my heart as a person because I believe that every one of us in here struggles with the order and the clarity behind these two ideas. I think many of us put the order backwards and we think, oh, the Bible is actually teaching people how to live and then it teaches them how to be saved after that. Like you're supposed to live a certain way, you're supposed to clean up your act and then you're finally saved. Amen, you know, whatever it might be. And and even though we may not say that, there's certain part of us that believe that. And the reason why I say this is because from day one of our lives, we are conditioned to believe that we are to be loved first before we are lovable, or excuse me, we're supposed to be lovable first before we are loved by God. That's the conditioning we have. We have this sense that we have to make ourselves lovable in order to be loved by God. And it's a sense in every single one of us, I think. And this is partly from family, relationships that we have. This is is part of us in our DNA. Now, for instance, let me give you the reason why I say this is because in my wife and I's relationship, uh, this had to happen. I had to make myself lovable for her to love me, quite honestly, with you, because I'm not all that lovable in and of myself. It's funny, because my wife is a, um, a very much a people person. She is a raging extrovert, and she loves people. She can talk all day and night with friends. She hangs out. She loses track of time when she hangs out with her friends. I love that about her. I love it. It's dear and, near and dear to me. She gets fired up at a party, and she gets all excited about it afterwards, you know? For me, I'm more of an introverted personality, and so I get all frustrated sometimes around too many people and I kind of hide in the corner at a party and I watch everyone because that's kind of a fun way of doing it for me. I'm like, you know, it's like people are in the zoo or something like that for me and I'm watching them because it's really fun because I really like people and I like to watch them from a distance, right, you know? But so we had this difference. Now the funny thing is when we were in college when we first met 17 years ago, whatever that was, it was kind of interesting because we were there and my wife would always do her homework in the library because she wanted to be with people and there were always people wandering around the library hanging out there. 
I would do my homework in the dorm room or in the apartment that I had, quietly by myself, doing my own thing, you know? And it was so funny. Now, if I wanted to win my wife over, I had to actually go out of my dorm room and do my homework in the library. I had to come outside of myself a little bit to make myself somewhat lovable for her to love me. Now, I'm not that shy. I've never been really shy, so that's not been a big issue for me. But one of the things is, if I didn't make myself lovable by coming out and spending time with her, I would not have won her over. There would have been nothing there. I could have stayed in my dorm, not made myself lovable, and we would have gone our separate ways and things would have gone differently. There would be no little Bethany or little Zachary right now, probably in our world. But it's funny, I think we all do this. That's a silly example. But we make ourselves lovable to those around us. Think about your first dates that you had. Did you eat a salad instead of a steak so that you can make yourself look different, you know? Did you work really hard to make yourself look pretty at that moment on a date? Did you control your normally bad manners at that point, you know? You men out there, did you stop any bodily functions that you shouldn't do, right? We'll just leave it at that, right? Okay, you didn't do these things because you're making yourself lovable so that a person can love us. But I'm telling you, the Bible says something different about our relationship with Jesus, and that is this. We are loved to be lovable. That's the difference. There's a huge difference. There's a huge difference in our relationship with Christ and the fact that we are loved so that he can make us a person who loves others. And there's a sense that this order can't be confused. So the Bible's written to to teach us how to be saved and then teach us how to live out our salvation. And that's the order we need to keep in mind when we read James chapter two. We learn something really interesting here where the Bible gives us this warning about a person who has been saved already by Jesus is the context of what James is writing to. And he's pointing out to them that you're not living out that salvation and that's really dangerous. And so I I would say this, I, I wouldn't start with James two for a person who doesn't know anything about the Bible. I wouldn't go here first because this is written to a context of people who did know the Bible, who were calling themselves Christians. And so in some ways, church, this is written for us today. This is written for those of us in here who have professed to know Jesus, who have said, yes, I'm in, I've given my life to Jesus, and now I need to change the way I live. So it's written for us. And this passage, I believe, gives us really two truths, I'll say, and a warning in here for us to remind ourselves of what faith looks like. And the first thing we learn, or the first truth we learn, is this. Our faith requires effort. That's the first truth we learn. Our faith requires effort. Now you may say, that doesn't, that doesn't sound right, but, but there was a sense when I was on the bridge to go bungee jump, I, I had to put my faith into actions. I had to do that. Now I know there's a guy pushing all that stuff, and that's helpful, but I still had to be the one to actually take the plunge, to pay the money, or whatever it was. There was an effort that needed to happen. I couldn't just say, oh yeah, I think I'd bungee jump. Like, for instance, we were at Seafair on Friday. It was wonderful. It was very fun. We hung out, went to Genesee Park, and saw the Blue Angels and all this kind of stuff. And there was this conversation amongst our group, and we decided, who of you would go in the Blue Angel if you had a chance to get in a flight and fly around, you know? And it was really funny, because we talked about this, and everyone's like, well, yeah, I think so. But then there were people like, I'm not sure I'd do that, you know? Did you hear about Marcus Trufant? He passed out and threw up in the cockpit last on, on Thursday or whatever it was when he went with them. So there was this conversation would you actually do it? Would you put your faith, like, I don't believe that airplane is not going to crash into a huge ball of flames somewhere and I'm not going to be in it. Would you put your faith into action? See, our faith requires effort. So let's talk about faith a little bit. Faith becomes a very popular word in our culture today. Everyone talks about it. I mean, everyone from the person who buys a lottery ticket to pastors, of course, who talk about it, but so do politicians. Anyone who's a Mariners fan talks about faith often, you know. Anyone who has sports in their DNA thinks about faith. If we have enough faith, we can win, you know. But there's so much in there that's fuzzy about faith. And and that same fuzziness, I think, was somewhat apparent in the first century here when James wrote this, because they didn't know what faith meant. And so James wants to open up the world of what faith really means to people. And he says, you may think faith just means a vocal acknowledgement of I believe or a head knowledge, but there's actions behind it as well. Your faith requires effort is what I say and what I think James is saying here. You know, the Holman, commentary on, uh, the Holman, Holman Christian Bible commentary on this says, we live in an age when many people limit faith to a mere verbal affirmation of 
I believe. But James' warnings here remind us that people who have correct belief and an empty life are actually quite deceived. They must have a faith which produces visible evidence of commitment to Jesus Christ. And that's the truth of the first truth of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Our faith requires effort. It requires something of you and it requires something of me. Now, there's a practical and theological problem in this passage. Um, some of you may see these things. The practical problem here is that there are too many people who, who are in his church who have been raised to believe that, that their profession of faith is enough, that they can just live with that, and that's all they need, and it doesn't really affect their life. You know, Maybe they've raised their hand, if you will. Maybe they went to camp, summer camp or something. You know, I don't know if they had that in the first century, but maybe they did, and, and they had some experience where the youth pastor got up with a guitar, and he has a goatee, you know, the whole thing, and he plays the guitar, and then he has this convicting message, and, and everyone goes, yeah, I'm going to change my life completely. Walked forward, and then life doesn't change at all. And James is frustrated. He says, no, oh, that's not the way you can't, you can't do it that way. You have to add to your faith effort, in a sense. You can't just profess Christ and still have worldly priorities and still lead selfish lives. That's the practical problem here. The theological problem is different. Where James 2.24 says, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Huge theological problem for those who are nerds in the Bible. It's one of those things where you look at and you go, I've been taught all my life that faith is what saves you. I've been, that's the way I've been raised. Like I read the rest of the Bible and see that. And from everything you may think, you may think what I've said to you just a moment ago about the way Jesus loves you, that he loves you first so that you can be lovable, not so that you have to be lovable in order to be loved. You may think I'm being contradicted by what James says here in, in verse 224. But let's go back to the question, I think, in verse 14 that helps us to see the entire reason for this argument. He's asking, James is asking kind of a hypothetical question here, and he says, what kind of faith can save you? Can that faith save you? Is that what's going on? So in this rabbinical style, James uses this kind of imaginary person who he carries on this intense dialogue and then yells at him, you know, you foolish person, what are you doing? This is not the way you're supposed to be living. So we go back once again to that purpose of the Bible. How are we saved? We are saved by faith in Christ Jesus. We can't earn that salvation. We can only accept it. But how do saved people live? They live in obedience to the teachings of the one we call our one Lord. It is not either faith or works. It is both faith and works. And that's the picture we get in James. And that may be intense. That's that theological issue that some of us have to wrestle with. And you'll have to wrestle with even when you leave here because I think the tension is supposed to be there. I think we're supposed to feel on a regular basis. Then we're not supposed to feel like we can walk out of here just saying we believe something and live whatever kind of life we want to and feel like we're okay, that things will be just fine. James throws a monkey wrench in that and says, really think about the way you're living. Are you living the right way? The Puritan theologian John Owen says it really well when he says, it may be said that faith alone saves, but saving faith is never alone. It completes itself in deeds. I like that idea. So saving faith, faith alone can save you, but saving faith is never alone. It completes itself in deeds. So our faith requires effort. It requires something of us. Now, James isn't the only New Testament writer who championed a faith that works hard. For all his teaching on grace and that faith alone is what saves you by grace, the Apostle Paul, who we may think actually is arguing with James here, if you know the background of the Bible at all, talks a lot about how our faith is worked out in our lives. Now, if you don't believe me, let's look at two of the most famous places on grace in the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. I want to read this to you. I'll have it on the screen behind me. Paul writes these words. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. Now, check out the next part. Don't forget the next part. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Moreover, let's look at another one. If you don't believe me, just on one. In Titus 2, 11 through 14, he notes the work of salvation with the consequent change of behavior that faith does, that effort that it requires. When he writes these words, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, 
training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for, let's say it together, good works. See, Paul actually links the two together. Salvation by grace through faith is linked to how our lives are changed. And I love that idea. It's a tension. It's a dichotomy of faith, if you will. But there's truth to it, and we need to accept that. Now, allow me to give you a little history there just briefly. Uh, Did you know that James and Paul knew each other? They they hung out together. They knew that they were kind of pastors in the ancient world together, and and surely they had connections. Historians agree on this. In fact, even the Bible agrees on this. In Galatians 1, 18 through 20, we learn that Paul went and saw James back in Jerusalem at one point during his ministry there. And Paul would go and report about all the things that are going on with the Gentiles to to the Jewish Christians who stayed in Jerusalem, who James was one of those who pastored those people there, hung out with them. Now, if you know anything about Paul, he was not afraid to confront people. In fact, he has a story when Paul and Peter are in Antioch together where Peter decided to be prejudiced and not hang out with the Gentiles and so Paul, the Bible says, opposed him to his face, is what he said. They had like a, like a smackdown, a first century smackdown, right? They even talk about the right hand of fellowship in that passage I find is really funny, like right, hand, you know, right fist of fellowship. They were, they were mad at each other and Paul corrected Peter at a time in his life where he was being prejudiced. Paul was not afraid to conflict with anyone one who was, was going against the gospel. Now, if James and Paul disagreed, we would know it. We would. There'd be fighting, there'd be writings about it, there'd be stuff extra biblically about it, but we see here that they know each other, and there's no frustration between the two of them about what James is saying, what Paul is saying, because I think what they're saying is the same thing. Paul says, you're saved by grace through faith. James says, you're saved by grace through faith. Faith requires effort is what he says here. And I like that idea. I like the idea. So, it's, so I would say, again, when, when we come to faith in Christ, we know we have a faith in Christ when our works start to show that, when our hearts start to change, when we start to desire the things that God desires for us. And, and so once again, I would say that, that James 2 isn't for a person who is trying to find out how to know Jesus. It's for a person who's professed faith in Jesus already and is now wondering what's next in my life. And so James is not saying, excuse me, we need to add works to our faith if we want to get saved. He's saying that true faith, which is the engine of your life, actually results in works, in good works. Now that's a weighty thing for us. That's a weighty thing for us to think about because you have to process your own life. I mean, even in the beginning of James 2, 15 through 16 or 17, it talks about how to work out your salvation a little bit with the poor and needy here. And you have to have a conflict with the word. Well, oh my gosh, does that mean I have to feed every person I find in the street? Does that, what does that mean? And there's some wrestling that has to happen. How does your faith actually work itself out? Now, if you're wondering why I'm spending so much time on this first truth, and I'll not spend as much time on the next two things I'm going to say, is because there is a lot of confusion about this. And I believe this. As a pastor, this is so near and dear to my heart that people understand how salvation works. And I always wanted to to have a church that modeled the idea that salvation is not something you can earn on your own behavior, but it's something that we respond together as a community or as individuals to Christ and the great work that he's done for us. Everything we've done at Imprint Church is supposed to reflect that idea so that when the offering basket goes by in many churches, you feel compelled to give because maybe God will accept you then if you give him, you know, 20 bucks or something for the week. And God will be compelled by your great behavior that he'll decide to save you. Oh, you've done great, my child. Awesome job. We've modeled everything differently here. We've said, no, we respond to the grace of God in our lives. So we come and give. It's, I know mean, it's a little different, and I know it's not that big of a difference, but it means something to us. We respond in worship after the word is preached because we want to respond to Jesus and what he's doing in our lives. We take communion as a way to say, oh, I'm going to receive that today, and I'm going to say, I I believe in that. I'm going to live differently because of that. That's why I'm spending time on this. It's caused so much confusion in the past. Even one of the great reformers, Martin Luther, called uh, the the epistle of James a right straw epistle, is what he called it. He didn't like this book. 
He didn't like the, the things it was saying. He wrestled with it as a reformer. And if you know anything about Martin Luther, he was the one who fought against the Catholic Church in the, in the time of the Reformation for salvation being by grace through faith. And so he became a man that fought against this thing. But here is the truth. Our faith requires effort. And that's the idea behind James 2. Now, if that feels defeating to you, if that feels like a tough word for you today, or if you're wondering how, if your faith is actually real today, it's a good warning to take, especially if you're a Christian and one who's professed faith in Christ today. There's good news in this passage too. And I think this, there's a next truth we learn in this, so if our faith requires effort, the next truth we learn is this, our faith develops. Our faith develops, all right? This is the second truth we learn in this passage. There's, there's this two false ideas of faith out there. I talked about faith a lot. The first one is if, if you're a Christian, your life is completely put together. That's one of the false ideas out there. And the second thing is if, the second false idea, if you will, is if you're a Christian, your life has to be completely put together. Those are both false ideas. In fact, we learn this in the passage that our faith actually develops and God wants our faith to develop. And so if you're saying to me today, I, well, I just became a Christian recently and I don't know what good works mean. I'm still struggling with sin. I'm still fighting some of the old temptations that are there. I would say there's good news for you in this passage because God has you on a journey to help you develop your faith. Even the words I'm bringing today should encourage you to do good works, not to condemn you to feel like you're not living up to God's standards because God loves you first to make you lovable, to make you a person who can live out that. But we have this idea that faith develops. Christianity really becomes the doorway to life change. It's the start, it's not the end, we're not perfect, and it's the path we walk on to become more like Jesus Christ. And James here gives us some great biblical examples. I love the two examples he gives. If you don't believe me that faith develops in here, look at the two examples he gives us of Abraham and Rahab. Now, if you don't know anything about Abraham and Rahab, I'm sure you've heard of Abraham before, kind of the father of the Jewish nation. You've probably even sang that song, Father Abraham, as many, right? It's the, he's the father of the Jewish, we'll maybe even sing that this week at VBS, who knows, you know? But for Abraham, it took a long time for his faith to mature. You might think, well, Abraham, he's like the patriarch. He, like, he's a guy who's in the Bible. Shouldn't he have his life together? Do, do, you, know, do you know anything about Abraham? The guy was a mess in so many ways. It's so funny, he, he doubted God for a while. He experienced up and downs in his life. He lied about his wife. He said once that he wasn't even married. That's no good, right? No good, guys don't do that, right? He once, he, he once even got involved in sexual immorality with his maidservant Hagar. He was not a good father. The guy failed miserably as a father. Abraham had some serious sin issues in his life, and we can read about them. And I think there's a reason that James uses him as an example here, because suddenly you realize, oh, that guy's not perfect either. That guy's not the, the picture-perfect sign of what a Christian looks like, but there's something that's interesting that happens. In the history of, of God's redemption in Genesis 15, the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and was credited to him, or was, it was given to him as righteousness, that Abraham believed him. But then there's this time between Genesis 15 and 22 where he doubted God again. There was crisis in his life. You can read that later where things went on and you kind of go, what, what happened from Genesis 15 to Genesis 22? But then in Genesis 22, he has this experience with God where God asks him to do something incredibly shocking to most of us and to our modern minds where he says, you must sacrifice your son Isaac on the altar and you must go and do this as an act of obedience to me. Because God was bringing him on a journey of, of faith, in a sense. And, and we don't know a lot of reasons why all that happened, and I know there's some confusion, some craziness in there. We know that Abraham believed that God could raise the dead, is one thing we see in Hebrews chapter 11. Or maybe he thought that God would do something different. We don't know. But there was something in that where God asked Abraham's faith to develop, because he was a mess at times. So faith came, it's credited him as righteousness, Genesis 15. How do you walk out your faith came in Genesis chapter 22 when he actually had to go and live out his faith, which became a pretty shocking story. Abraham's faith developed. One of the patriarchs, the great fathers of our faith had to develop in his faith. Rahab. Why even mention Rahab here? Do you know anything about Rahab? Prostitute, a gal whose life was evidently not put together in any way, shape, or form. And I wonder sometimes why 
James just didn't stop with Abraham. It's a pretty good example. You know, it makes sense. But, but here's Rahab who had a rough life. She had a very tough life. We don't know why she was a prostitute. We can understand that there are probably things in her life where she couldn't provide for her own needs, and so this became her only way of gaining income to survive, to sustain herself. We don't know what her life was like, but we know it was vastly different than Abraham's. Abraham, who lived a life of somewhat opulence, Rahab, who was broken, and things were not going well for her. But it's really interesting, in Joshua chapter 2, the Bible talks about how she believes the promise of the Lord, the God of heaven above and in the earth below, and she allowed the spies to stay with her, and then she allowed them to sneak out of her house because she, the Bible says, believed in God. Now, that was a start. Her, her faith was developing. Now, I would just venture to guess you're probably somewhere between Abraham and Rahab today, right? That's a guess. We probably find ourselves not so destitute like Rahab, not so patriarchal in such a great spot as Abraham, but I think this example helps us understand that our faith is supposed to develop, just like Abraham, just like Rahab. And that's the beauty of the Christian faith. You don't have it all together when you say yes to Jesus, but God, by his grace, helps you build that into your life, and your faith will develop in that way. So if you feel defeated by the idea that your faith requires effort, don't feel defeated. Take steps towards Jesus. Let him work in you so that your faith works through you. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's the encouragement of James chapter 2. Most of you probably relate to having a faith in progress, as Abraham and Rahab here do. You know, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to share the gospel with a guy. He was going through some hard times. And I remember he was not a Christian yet, but he said something really important to me, which I have not forgotten to this day. And he said, well, I, I can't become a Christian because I can't stop committing sexual sins is what he said to me. And he was pretty graphic in the way he said this, but I toned it down for church on Sunday morning. And I said, Alan, you, you missed it. Come to Jesus. He will help you stop doing those things. Like, say yes to him. The Holy Spirit will help you and start to work in and through you so that your life will change. Because your life, your faith does require effort, but, but it develops too and your faith will develop. So no matter where you're at today, if you're new in your Christian journey, if you haven't even taken that step yet into the Christian journey, there's good news for you because this effort may sound debilitating and, and scary to you, but the good news is that your faith can develop and that's what Christ wants for you as well. And finally, the, in closing here today, the controversial warning of James 2, and I can't not get to this because it's in the text, but this strange idea is this. Our faith can die. Our faith can die. That's the controversial warning in James chapter two. Keep in mind again that James is talking to religious people here to remind them what their faith should look like. It requires that effort and develops as we give it that effort, but this warning is really stern. In fact, this die, this useless word, shows up three times in the passage, in verse 17, in verse 20, in verse 26, and James warns them that faith can die. And it's a really crazy thing. In the warning to them, he even mentions this idea where he says, you may say that God is one. You may say that. Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. They're nervous. He's speaking to very religious people who go through the motions of proclaiming God is their Lord. That's the famous Shema from Deuteronomy 6.4 that Jewish people were required to say every day as part of their worship, but it became evidently kind of rote to them. They just say it. They wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't bring it into their lives and then live it out as they went throughout their week. And this warning comes to them and says, look, your, your faith can die. It can become useless to you, is the idea. Now you may say, that's kind of a weird word, die. It's the Greek word necros, right? Which we get the word necrosis from. Anyone know what necrosis is? It's when your cells die and things in your body will actually be chopped off if you cannot bring them back to life, to life again. Necrosis, that's what Paul, excuse me, that's what James is saying here. And when he says in James 2, as, apart from the body, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. So the options you have here is your faith should develop in your life. Your faith should require effort of you, otherwise necrosis sets in, death sets in. Pretty stern warning for us. So the question is, do you have real saving faith? Do you have areas of your life instead where you're saying to God, I, 
I can't give that up. I, I live my own way. I do my own thing, and I could care less what you have to say about that. Or are you allowing your faith to work in you and through you? Are you allowing Jesus to work on you on a regular basis so that effort is coming and so that there's some developing in your life? Let me give you a simple test, a really practical test to see if your faith is dying today. Just ask yourself this question. Are you struggling with sin? Do you wrestle with sin? If you do, that's good news. It's real good news. When you stop struggling with sin, that's when you know your faith is dying. But the moment that you say, I, I, you know, I'm done sinning, or the moment you say, I don't need to struggle with sin anymore, is when you start to see necrosis set in, where you're starting to realize you're not becoming more like Jesus anymore, where you're satisfied, or you might be saying there's one Lord, if you will, in James 2, but you're not living like it. But the real test of a Christian is someone who sees struggle in their life, who sees the effort that they are going to to see faith develop in their life and see sins they need to continually repent of, that I'm not becoming more like Jesus in this particular area of my life. I think struggling with sin is a sign of true commitment, of true faith in Christ, until we see him face to face, and until he wipes sin away from us, and from the world around us, and from all our friends and family, we'll struggle with sin. And if we're struggling with it, if there's no struggle, there's probably no true commitment. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. He says, the grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. The grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. So the dichotomy of faith today. Jesus loves you enough to accept you as you are, but loves you too much to let you stay the way you are. That's good news today. That's not defeating to you. That should be hopeful to you, to know that your faith requires effort of you, It develops in you, and if you don't see that effort and development happening, there can be death that sets in, that warning that we see in James chapter 2. So we get to respond to that this morning. We get to respond to the harsh words. We get to see these words as appropriated to our lives as people. And I I find this too. I I look at this thing and I see, oh yeah, there's so many areas of, of sin and brokenness, even in my own life, that I can repent of. And so even today, you get a chance to evaluate. Think about your own life. How are you living Is your faith requiring effort of you? Is your faith developing over time? Is that happening in your life? We're going to sing a few songs here and we get to worship together and Nate's going to come back and lead us in some worship. And during this time, I would encourage you to think about your life and to worship Jesus for what he's done for us, to thank him for his saving faith that he's he's gifted to us and how it's supposed to work out in our lives. And then not only that, but we get a chance to receive communion. You can come up at any time during these next few songs and receive communion to take that bread, dip it in the cup, and receive that as a way of proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes, of of saying to him, "I, I want my faith to develop. I want my faith to require something of me. When I leave this place, I I want to be different. I want to change in the way I'm living my life. I don't want a dead faith. I don't want that to happen to me. And you can even do that when you come and receive communion. Not as as the, the Jewish people who James is warning here. Don't just go through the motions, but as a person who's going to do it as an act of faith before the Lord. I also mentioned you can give during this time. There are baskets on here. We give because of God's great generosity to us through Christ. And if you're a visitor today, we don't want your money. Jesus wants your heart. That's why we exist as a church. And if you have a guest card, you can come up and drop it in those baskets at any time during these next few songs as a way of just stepping out and saying, I want to take a next step here as well. And then finally, you can pray. We have uh, prayer people would be willing to pray for you and and pray for things that are going on in your life. But more, we would have a prayer cue on the screen behind us. And there's a serious prayer cue this morning, a prayer cue to think about our own lives and places where we need to repent of and turn to the Lord from our sins, from our brokenness, and to take those next steps of faith, the the effort that is required and the, the fact that it develops in us so that our faith does not die. So I would say for us as Imprint Church, all of us together, let's do this. Let's take this seriously today. Let's take these words of James and and apply them to our lives. When we walk out of here, we are new and different people each and every time. Okay, amen? Let's pray about these things. God, thanks for your word to us. It's uh, strong words, and I'm uh, grateful for that. I'm grateful that you, um, you offer us these words as a as as truth and warning to us. And Lord, as we come before you today, I pray that we would not um, confuse the idea of how we gain our salvation. We would not confuse um, coming to faith in Christ as a free gift of yours, but that should ultimately change our lives and to make us more like Jesus. And so Lord, help us today to, to, to have our faith not die 
to not just become something we do on a Sunday morning and doesn't change our life throughout the week. Help us take this warning very seriously because the dichotomy of faith is that, Jesus, you, you love us, but you love us too much to let us stay where we're at right now. And so, Jesus, we commit ourselves to you. And we ask, Lord, that by your grace, you'd help us change now through the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Help us to build our faith into our lives on a regular basis. Thanks for these words today. Through James, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.